Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need that seat. Get on your feet and raise the roof for your 2016-2017 National FFA Officer Team. Our Southern Region Vice President from South Carolina, Daisha Blanding. Our Western Region Vice President from Texas, Trey Elizondo. Our Eastern Region Vice President from New York, Ashley Willis. Our Central Region Vice President from Minnesota, Valerie. National FFA Secretary from Florida, Victoria Harris, and our National FFA President from Delaware, David Townsend. Here we go, here we go. It's about time now we say it all. Here we go, here we go. Red lights, I can never stop. Convention Hall will come to order. We're now holding the first general session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. <laughs> Madam Vice President, are all officers at their stations? I shall call the roll of officers, determine if they're at their stations, and report back to you, Mr. President. <laughs> the Sentinel. Stationed by the door. Your duty's there. Through this door pass many friends of the FFA. It is my duty to see that the door is open to our friends at all times and that they are welcome. I care for the meeting room of paraphernalia. I strive to keep the room comfortable and assist the president in maintaining order. The reporter. The reporter is stationed by the flag. Why by the flag? As the flag covers the United States of America, so I strive to inform the people in order that every man, woman, and child may know that the FFA is a national organization that reaches from the state of Alaska to the Virgin Islands and from the state of Maine to Hawaii. The treasure. Stationed at the emblem of Washington. Your duties there. I keep a record of receipts and disbursements. Just as Washington kept his farm account, carefully and accurately. I encourage thrift among the members and strive to build up our financial standing through savings and investments. George Washington was better able to serve his country because he was financially independent. The secretary, stationed by the ear of corn. Your duty's there. I keep an accurate record of all meetings and correspond with other secretaries, wherever corn is grown and FFA members meet. The advisor. Here by the owl. Why stationed by the owl? The owl is a time-honored emblem of knowledge and wisdom. Being older than the rest of you, I'm asked to advise you from time to time as the need arises. I hope that my advice will always be based on true knowledge and ripened with wisdom. Madam Vice President, why do you keep a plow at your station? 
The plow is the symbol of labor and tillage of the soil. Without labor, neither knowledge nor wisdom can accomplish much. My duties require me to assist at all times in directing the work of our organization. I preside, I preside over meetings in the absence of our president, whose place is beneath the rising sun. Why is the president so stationed? The rising sun is the token of a new era in agriculture. If we will follow the leadership of our president, we shall be led out of the darkness of selfishness and into the glorious sunlight of brotherhood and cooperation. Mr. President, all officers are at their stations. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The secretary will call the roll of members. I am pleased to announce that at this, the first general session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo, there are 59,132 members and guests registered, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you. FFA members, why are we here? <laughs> to practice brotherhood, honor agricultural opportunities and responsibilities, and develop those qualities of leadership which an FFA member should possess. <laughs> May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare this first general session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo duly open for the transaction of business or attention to any matters which may properly be presented. Many of us are related to or know someone who has or is serving our country in the U.S. Armed Forces. In my family, it started with my grandfather, who served in the Air Force throughout the Korean War. Individually, people like my grandfather, brother, and cousin can work to defend our flag. And together, our military fights to ensure our freedoms as citizens of this great country. In FFA, we are united by our emblem, a symbol we wear on our chest and our backs that represents the values of our organization. As a country, however, we are united by the flag our military fights to defend. Today, we have the opportunity to show our respect, adoration, and gratitude for the men and women who fight so we have the opportunity to gather here at convention this week. FFA members and guests, please join me in welcoming the T.C. Howe High School Junior ROTC Color Guard as we honor our country and the individuals who have served it through the presentation of colors. Members of the Guard are Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Rhonda Wheeler, Commander, Cadet Second Lieutenant Dakota Wallstetter, Cadet Command Sergeant Major, Major Michael Lobos, Cadet Staff Sergeant Jared Petro, Cadet Staff Sergeant Dre Harding, and Cadet Staff Sergeant Agent Snyder. Please rise as they present the colors of the United States of America.
The chair for our next session could probably be found chatting about the latest and strangest ice cream flavor at the University of Delaware's Creamery, raving about his favorite gas station Wawa, or even practicing a new talent. This year, the team and I have discovered that he has plenty of strange but kind of cool talents. Need a dollar bill folded into a bow tie? He's your guy. Want to know the perfect place to hang your hammock? He'll help you. Or want to learn how to do a backflip or a headstand? He can do that too. While his talents may be cool, what we appreciate most about him is what he brings to our team. No matter the time of day or night, he is always up for a life chat or an adventure. He is someone we can always count on. Let's go ahead and show our love and put our hands together for our national FFA president, Mr. David Townsend. <laughs> With eight seasons and 192 incredible episodes, there was no show we watched more as a family growing up. Every day after school, we would rush home, turn on the TV, and see what the Tanners were getting up to that day. Much like my own family, it always seemed to be something crazy, dramatic, and yet somehow completely relatable. Regardless of what happened, it always seemed to bring the family closer together in the end. You know, growing up with 10 siblings, I was always told that the Townsends should have a reality TV show of her own. While improbable, I've always wondered what that show would look like. And you know, with as many people as lived in our house growing up as there was, why wouldn't we just remake Full House? It'd be perfect. Full House, Townsend edition. I think one of the only differences would be the members of the cast. Instead of these actors and actresses, we would have... My siblings and I. <laughs> While we may look different from the Tanners, we could always relate to the crazy adventures of this family. With each episode, we'll see a Full House Townsend edition will clearly demonstrate that individually we are capable, but together we're able to be much more effective. More and more, FFA also reminds me of a great big family. 
This week, we are gathered here together with tens of thousands of fellow FFA members from across the country. So this week at convention, why not reach out and meet some other members that you may have never met? Attend a leadership workshop, the rodeo, or the concert. Explore the expo, or meet somebody new. Change the world together, because I can, we will. As a team, we have defined what I can, we will means for us through reflections earlier this session. As individuals and as chapters, however, we get to decide how we will live out. I can, we will, here at convention and as we head back home. Throughout this first session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo, we will see how that cooperative spirit is seen through the lens of Full House Townsend Edition. Each episode we will see will share a different story as others demonstrate a collaborative spirit and make our organization better together. We will hear from our past national president, Taylor McNeil, and the owl himself, our national FFA advisor, Dr. Steve Brown. We'll meet those individuals who will be bringing us music all week, our national FFA band and chorus, honor the 100th anniversary of the Smith Hughes Act, and finally hear the inspiring words of our keynote speaker, Layla Ali. Get ready for a blast from the past, complete with awkward childhood photos and tons of memories as we kick off this first session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. As early as the third episode, we are introduced to one of the most memorable characters of Full House, Kimmy Gibbler. Kimmy is known for being unapologetically herself and often barging into the Tanner household unannounced. But above all, Kimmy genuinely loves the people around her. In Full House Townsend edition, Kimmy would probably equate to my sister Sarah's childhood best friend, Hannah. And to our team this year, Kimmy Gibbler may just be this next individual. Along with her five teammates, she worked tirelessly for an entire year, working to serve our organization and transform the lives of students. She always lives with the highest intentions, loves her Southern Arkansas University Mule Riders, and genuinely loves others from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, here to deliver reflections, please welcome our past national president, Taylor McNeil. As I prepared for a convention, I couldn't help but think about all of the opportunities that we'll have this week that will completely change our lives. And as I reflected on my own time spent here at convention, I was reminded of one of my favorite stories. It talks about a young girl who suddenly found herself in a position to lead those around her, but she wasn't sure if she'd be able to do that. You see, her whole life things had never really quite worked out the way that she had hoped. And she lacked the confidence when she found herself in that position to lead others. And as she was struggling and trying to figure out her purpose and why she was there, she got some advice from a friend. This friend came to her and said, maybe, just maybe, you were brought to this place for a time such as this. Maybe you were brought to this place for a time such as this. Basically saying that now that she was in this leadership role, she was able to serve others because of her experiences and her opportunities and also some of those struggles that she had. Maybe when we hear this story, it strikes a chord with us because we can relate. We're here in a leadership position, but maybe we've had struggles in the past and we're doubting our ability. But know that you were brought to this place the National FFA Convention and Expo for a time such as this to lead and serve those people around you. Maybe you can also relate to the friend in the story and know that you have words of encouragement that you can give to those people around you. You were also made for a time such as this to encourage and inspire those that you get to spend this week with. And knowing if we're either leading or serving or encouraging those around us, we were made for a time such as this at this convention. And it can start right now by staying engaged in this session, going out to the expo, checking out a college or a career, chatting with an alumni member, thanking a sponsor, getting to know your chapter, but also 
meeting people from other states that you don't know. You were made for a time such as this, so don't let a moment pass you by where you aren't fully engaged in what's going around or going on around you, because know that you were brought to this place for a time such as this. Thank you. Taylor, thank you so much for being with, being with us here today and for demonstrating your support of students and organization as a whole. It is incredible to see how throughout your year and beyond you've demonstrated the spirit of I can, we will. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2015-2016 National FFA President, Taylor McNeil. Season 2, Episode 20. The Tanners run into some trouble when Jesse accidentally double books his band, but not to worry, because the whole family pitches in to help out, and the surprisingly musically talented Tanners are able to successfully cover for the band. While in Full House with the Tanners, everything seemed to work out, in Full House Townsend edition, this episode probably would have looked more like those not-so-well-practiced middle school band concerts we were a part of as kids. <laughs> Lucky for us, we don't have to deal with that either. And better yet, we have the opportunity to be entertained by incredibly talented students from across the country for not just one session, but all of convention. Ladies and gentlemen, under the direction of Joe and Patty the Joy and sponsored by Dow Auger Sciences, please welcome for the first time our national FFA band and chorus.
Thank you so much for your performance and for kicking off this first session of the 90th National Cafe Convention and Expo. We look forward to hearing from you throughout the week. Another round of applause for our National FFA Band and Chorus. <laughs> While we may not make up the best chorus and band as a family, our house is always filled with the familiar tunes of my mom playing the piano. Appropriately, in addition to our National FFA Band and Chorus, we have the opportunity to be joined by a musician that will be filling this full house with catchy tunes all week. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in joining our national FFA organist, and his name is John Shuddy! <laughs> yeah. It takes a ton of people to make the production of Full House a reality. And Full House Townsend Edition wouldn't be possible without the support of friends and family to help us in pursuit of career success. The same is true of the different components we will experience this week at convention. This opening session wouldn't be possible without the support and sponsorship from our friends at Merck Animal Health. To show your thanks for them, go ahead and stop by the expo booth and grab one of these squishy animals. Who wants one? Let's give Merck Animal Health a huge round of applause for sponsoring this session. A signature component of the Full House set is the living room. This is a space filled with laughter and high energy games, but also a place of some of the show's most serious and somber moments. In Full House Townsend Edition, this cornerstone setting is our extra large dinner table. The dining room table has seen its fair share of, fair share of intense games of spoons and phase 10, but is also the place of some of the greatest life chats and awesome conversations over dinner. The dining room table is versatile enough to be useful in whichever way it is needed, yet stable enough to support us no matter the situation taking place at it. The same is true of this next speaker in the department which he represents. He is versatile enough to ensure that all producers and consumers' needs are heard and appeased, while showing his support for agriculture and agriculture education throughout his many roles and throughout his work for the Department of Agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming our United States Secretary of Agriculture, the Honorable Sonny Perdue. Well, hello, National FFA. It looks like a packed house here tonight. Is this the final four or FFA? FFA, good deal. David, thank you for that introduction. And Valerie, thank you for helping me get to the right place here tonight. And uh, what a tremendous crowd. We've already acknowledged a packed house here at the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. And uh, I absolutely got off the airplane today at the International Airport and walked down the escalator. And what did I see? A big, bold theme there. I love it. I can, we will, right? Can, let's, let's do a little response there, if you would. You're going to help me? I'm going to do the first part, and you do the second. I can. We will. I can. And yes, you will. I believe you will because I believe in FFA and the young people who represent you all across this country and what a great organization you're a part of. And I think you understand from my having been across your country how much I appreciate seeing you when I travel to these many states and uh, even foreign countries and uh, the FFA influence they're having around the world. So now if you'll look up at the Jumbotron, you're gonna see my Twitter handle, it's Secretary Sonny. I want you to get out your smartphones right now. I know that's not usually what a speaker tells you, but get out your smartphones, it's okay. I know your teacher said don't be on that thing, but it's okay, I promise you. Get out your smartphones, we're gonna do that, because most of the time, you can't do that. But don't you believe in a little FFA competition? Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to give you an opportunity to 
take advantage of this competition and post your name of your state to tag Secretary Sonny, and we're going to see which state posts the most tweets to Secretary Sonny while we're here tonight. So why don't you do that, and you can get going doing that. So we'll see. We're going to keep track. By the way, you can continue to take your phones out and tweet during the convention what you're doing. You can live Facebook, whatever you want to do, because communication is key, and we want to hear from you young people particularly. Let me just tell you, uh, we got a great uh, uh, opportunity tonight, and uh, I want to tell you about one of your alumni. It wasn't just a year or so ago, but Ted McKinney, our new Hunger Secretary for, uh, uh, for Trade, is one of your guys. He's been involved in FFA since growing up on a farm here in Indiana, and we're proud to have him. Ted's now serving as our brand new undersecretary, about 10 days on the job. But I just want to use Ted as an example of the heritage and legacy of what FFA does. And that very heritage and legacy that I'm talking about that you all are carrying out day by day is something that I care very deeply about because I love not only FFA, but I love American agriculture and farmers and producers and ranchers and foresters all over this country. But exactly about six months ago, I was sworn in as the 31st Secretary of Agriculture. And since that day, I've traveled across the country, meeting with many of you in this very room, and I've enjoyed the opportunity of seeing you again here today as we visited. So just as evidence of that, I want you to look behind me, take a look on the a video on the monitor of where I've been with you all across the country. Recognize anybody up there? Don't worry. If you didn't see yourself up there, I'll be at your chapter soon, okay? So uh, I love young people, and I love FFA young people. And uh, you know the reason? You don't know what you don't know. And I like that. I'll tell you why. You've not yet learned or been programmed that the, with the thought that you can't accomplish your dreams. And that's what I like about the enthusiasm and the optimism of young people. And frankly, that's one thing I hope you never, never learn, is that you can accomplish those dreams. I want you, as FFA, as future uh, agriculturalists of America, I want you to, to think about, to dream build big, and to believe that you can accomplish that. Because no doubt, you all inspire me literally and make me feel good about agriculture being in the safe hands of our next generation. Let's get serious just for a moment and talk about growing your legacy because you have a lot invested and you've got a lot of time uh, to be invested in this country and in the, in the things. Frankly, you through the FFA program are developing the character, the confidence, and the compassion that it takes to be a leader. And let me tell you how that, you will be the leaders of the next generation but just like Ted McKinney, you're growing a legacy right now. You don't have to wait. You can understand that you are developing that character, that confidence, and that compassion to be the true leaders of the next generation. So let's talk about that legacy for just a moment. I want to add another C, frankly, to that character, confidence, and compassion because you're going to need it in your generation. Farmers in past years may not have thought much about this, but you won't be able to dismiss it because this world of new era of communication, we can't ignore it. And that is character, confidence, compassion, 
communication. You're going to be able to have to learn how to communicate with your federal consumers and your federal, fellow man around the world, not just here in the United States. So I want to talk about the legacy that learns. You're growing a legacy that learns. There's so many new learning opportunities today in FFA with tools available. Just take broadband, for instance. Connecting the connectivity that broadband gives us with the ability to communicate, giving rural America access to learning technology just like any urban or suburban area in our country. We need more of it. We need to make sure that it's in every field and farm and farmhouse across America. There's a growing interest and emphasis on agricultural programs and urban schools. There's a real, uh, a real demand out there for people who didn't have the opportunity to grow up on a farm to understand where our food comes from. Learning about agriculture is no longer just for the young person on the farm in rural areas. Let me give you an example. Just, a, just this past week, I was meeting with a member of Congress. His name's Dwight Evans. He represents an urban Philadelphia uh, district. And he was telling me with such pride about the Walter Biddle Saul High School of Agricultural Sciences. You ever heard of that? I had not, but he tells me that it's the largest agricultural farm school in the United States, a 130-acre working farm with the FFA there. It has the largest single chapter in FFA chapter in the United States at the Saul Agricultural School in Philadelphia. Students there have launched, listen to this, students there launched YouTube. Did you know that? Where YouTube was started? Their YouTube was spelled E-W-E, tube. And, uh, and they also did Philly Watch so they could teach their colleagues and kids across America and Philadelphia about uh, live streaming channels on the internet to showcase the lamb and colt programs, including streaming live births at some of the fairs around the country. That's been a very popular thing. People wait there for hours to see that, and you could watch it right there on their EWE YouTube. So that's pretty creative. We look for more of those to come along. So students face stiff competition in Philadelphia to be admitted in the district to gain admission there. So we know, see once again that FFA is not just for rural America, it's for America. Last July, we had a large group. Many of you came to Washington and uh, was able to sign a memorandum of understanding between FFA and USDA. We promise to stand with you and I want you to know we're delivering on our promises and we're looking even more forward to a more concrete and uh, definitive relationship between the USDA and FFA. We're committed to helping you learn and grow for the future. There's a good reason to study agriculture. A recent study by Purdue University showed that there's a growing, increasingly growing demand for jobs in agriculture. What you're learning in FFA today will benefit you in all other learning paths you may take. Take, for example, you may have watched a city council meeting or even a state legislative meeting. The types of meetings you are trained to conduct, conduct in your local chapters, understanding the order, rules, Robert's Rules of Order, those kind of things, parliamentary inquiries, those kind of things you'll be able to take through your lifetime in fact, you may be able to teach some adults as you young kids get elected to city councils and county commissions across the country in your 20s, you may be able to teach the old guys how to conduct a meeting by, by chance. So what you're gonna learn in FFA will benefit you for the rest of your life and you are growing, I hope you understand now, you are blessed to be growing a legacy that learns. But also, in FFA, you're growing a legacy that leads because you're diver de 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 learning how to be a leader by the way you conduct yourself. I've been around many great organizations for young people. I've never met a group of young people with such leadership skills as those in FFA. Every time I meet one of you, you look me in the eye, you give me a firm handshake, you tell me your name, you tell me your front, where you're from, and all different kinds of things about you. I like that. That will carry you a long way. You don't understand what a distinction that will be among you and your peers as you go out into the walkways of life going forward. 
one, as one of the sitting governor of Georgia, one of my fondest and most rewarding achievements was the investment in young people and the leadership development through our internship program. And I can tell you that I could spot the FFA students in those internship programs right away. You always stood out. We need great communicators, as I said, not only character, confidence, and compassion, but we need communicators and communication skills. You must learn how to communicate, how to speak up. Just look at what you did on Twitter. You know the power of that. We're in a new age of communication now, and uh, you understand it better than people in my generation. In fact, if I could ask you to raise your hand if you've taught your parents or grandparents something about social media, I imagine it would go up all over. Why don't you just raise your hand if you had the chance to teach an adult about social media? See, you get it, we don't, and we need your help, okay? So uh, please help us. In fact, uh, I, uh, I work for one guy who gets it, though. In fact, President Trump has indicated he may not have been, even been president without Twitter. So you can see the power of Twitter and social media. So go FFA. You know, learn to communicate because you got a great story to tell. That's the main thing. American farmers and ranchers feed and clothe the world, and we need you to tell that great story. And frankly, your credibility among your peers and your age group is much greater than me getting up there and lecturing them about all those things. They will trust you and they will believe you much quicker than they do me. No longer, no longer in the 21st century can we stay behind our farm gate fences and, and gates and say, I'm just a producer and whatever y'all do out there is okay. We cannot afford that because what will happen is those people are gonna come through that farm gate and tell us how to do our business if we don't tell them already how we're doing safely and uh, ecologically and soundly and economically, uh, environmentally sustainable in a way that they will believe and trust us. So I'm sounding the alarm that you as young agriculture leaders must grow and develop as communicators in the public arena. Let me emphasize this. You've got to grow and develop as truthful and bold communicators. What do I mean by that? You might have heard a little bit about fake news, right? Over the last uh, few months about fake news. We've got a communication crisis in America with fake news. As good as social media is in some way, it allows a lot of misinformation to be out there. You need to be the arbiters of truth in combating those misinformation stories. Some of the most outrageous stories that are without fact or without truth are rationalized under the guise of First Amendment rights to free speech. The late American statesman Daniel Patrick Moynihan put it this way, quote, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. You need to fa be the fact truth tellers to your generation and to a skeptical consumer world out there about many things that they read and possibly believe you can be an influencer through your communication. But in order to speak with confidence and persuasive authority, first of all, you gotta be knowledgeable. You gotta really know what you're talking about. That's what you're learning in FFA. We can't be echo chambers of, of just repeating things that we hear about how great farmers are. We've gotta be knowledgeable in the facts and, and communicate those. Secondly, you gotta have the confidence to believe that you're saying and what you're saying is true. You can only do that confidently if you believe in what you're saying and communicate that truth. And thank, frankly, finally, you need to communicate that with courage, but also with compassion. You don't need to denigrate or condemn, and certainly you don't need to resort to name calling for those people that don't agree with you. You can do it with charm, you can do it without guile. You can speak with courage because you're speaking the truth with integrity. Truth builds trust. And people will understand that. When you speak truth into their lives, they will begin to trust you as the communicators of that great American agricultural story. Frankly, we also need to be truthful with ourselves. Even when we fail and let people down, even when they, we must acknowledge at times and courageous enough 
to acknowledge that sometimes we fail, agriculture fails, and when we have, we need to acknowledge, we need to learn for it, from it, and commit to do better, and to communicate better. So FFA, I believe, is a great laboratory of civic engagement, not just in the classroom, not just where you are, but I'm talking about think big globally. We must have agricultural leaders engaged in all areas, and I want to challenge you to lead. Listen to a quote from George Washington. He said, I know of no pursuit in which more real and important services can be rendered to any country than by improving its agriculture. He said that a number of years ago. I think it's equally, if not more important today, of what he said. You have the opportunity, young people, let me tell you, you have the opportunity that I believe no other generation before you has ever had. People can live with a lot of things, but they can't live without food. Or my grandchildren may say broadband, but they can't live without food. Food's more important just than sustenance of life. Dr. Norman Borlag, you know who he is? I hope you do. If you don't, I hope you'll learn about Dr. Norman Borlag because I want to find out. Let's turn up the lights just a second. I want to look at these kids and ask them who's going to be the next Dr. Norman Borlag of the 21st century. If you don't know about the Green Revolution, you've got a wonderful opportunity. Dr. Borlag won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2006. Only five individuals in the world have won both. And sadly, not many people know who he is or what he did. He's known for saving literally millions of lives from starvation in developing countries. I want to share just a few quotes from Dr. Norman Borlaug and listen to his heart, listen to his altruism, listen to his, his caring spirit and compassion for mankind. He says, for more than half a century, I've worked with the production of more and better wheat for feeding the hungry people. But wheat is merely a catalyst, a part of the picture. I'm interested in the total development of human beings. Only by attacking the whole problem can we raise the standard of living for all people in all communities so that they will be able to live decent lives. This is something that we want for all people on the planet. I want to know who would commit tonight to be that next Norman Borlaug for the 21st century because the challenge of feeding a hungry world is still there. Dr. Borlaug tied the importance of food to civilization itself when he said finally, civilization as it is known today could not have evolved nor it can survive without an adequate food supply. The first essential component of any Social justice is adequate food for all mankind. You are, in your educational experiences, already able to influence global agricultural policy by those devices you hold in your hand. Agricultural technology and agricultural production for the future of America. I can. I can. That is the challenge, and I want to exhort you to do that. We need you to take your civic engagement to shape public policy. FFA, as you know, originally stood for the future farmers of America. But I want to tell you young people, and listen to me closely if you don't hear anything else I say, you don't have to wait for the future. The future is now. Young people your age are making a difference all across the globe today, as you can as well. So don't think I've got to wait till I graduate, I've got to wait till I'm this age, I've got to wait till then. If you wait, you'll never get it done. Determine yourselves today, find a need and meet it and challenge because you are growing a legacy that leads. You're also growing a legacy that feeds. The population of the world, as you know, is growing rapidly and we expect, by most demographers tell us to expect in those planet, 9 billion people by the year 2050. That sounds like a long way off, but if you're my age, I can look back and know what was happening 35 years ago, and it's not that far away. So listen, it can happen very quickly. You'll be the ones to create new and better ways to grow more and feed more. You're also going to be the generation expected to prepare that next generation even after you. 
We are all blessed as we acknowledge because American farmers and ranchers grow more than we can consume. There are places in the world that literally cannot say the same. So to feed the world, we're going to have to engage with other nations in trade. Earlier I mentioned your FFA alumni, Ted McKinney, our new Secretary of Trade. He's going to be traveling the world to build those relationships and open markets. Our message to the farmers from USDA is a simple one. They're great producers. If they grow it, we're going to do our best to sell it all around the world. But trade's not just a one-way street. Feeding the world involves Americans buying products that we cannot produce easily here. That helps other nations and builds their capacity and their economy and their stability to feed the world. It helps uh, global migration to remain in place when their economies are healthy. In fact, we are blessed, and I was blessed to be able to visit with them this afternoon. We've got students from Mexico and Canada who've come here to participate. So let's take a moment, if you turn up the lights, to welcome our friends from Mexico and Canada who are joining us here in this great convention. Welcome, guys. We're glad to have you. I reminded them this afternoon, you take the United States of America, Canada, and Mexico, I believe we live in the greatest neighborhood on the planet, and we ought to take advantage of that. So you are growing a legacy that feeds and will need to feed a hungry and growing world in the 21st century. But also, I believe you are, in your areas, growing a legacy that believes. You know, you may know I was raised on a farm. I got a lot of good qualities and work ethic and a lot of things that way, but also know that from watching my parents and my father, my grandparents, it takes a lot of faith to be a farmer. Uh, I, I saw them on their faces, a time of great celebration with a good crop and enthusiasm when the crops are good and the market's high. But also, these are lives of tremendous challenge among these, uh, among these producers. I can remember as a young child, my parents surviving a severe, severe drought in 1954. It really almost cost us the family farm. I watched my father struggle every day after waiting for, hoping for, praying for rain. And then, just 40 years later, 1994, a terrible flood that devastated farms across middle and south Georgia. I was in agribusiness then, and many of our customers, I saw them utter despair as their healthy crops were flooded out, couldn't even get in the fields to harvest there. And just this year, we've seen, again, the ravages of nature with hurricanes of 2017 destroying cotton, pecans, citrus, and other crops across several states. And the horrific fires out west, again, are destroying farms land and crops as well. You know, as well as I do, Congress cannot pass a law that will make crops grow. We can't write a regulation in USDA that prevents hurricanes or floods or drought or fire or tornadoes. We're a people, I believe a vast people, who worship God and not government. I don't know really many farmers who don't have faith. As Americans, as farmers, faith is deeply embedded in our heritage. If you read our Declaration of Independence, you also see that those founders referred to our creators over and over, closing with this phrase, with a firm reliance on divine providence. That faith and reliance is at the core of what makes America great, America farming and American agriculture great, and I believe the FFA is continuing to grow a legacy that believes. Finally, you're growing a legacy that inspires. I've already told you how inspired I am about being around you and your members as I go into your chapters across the country. Sixteen years ago, most of you were just learning to crawl. Some of you have not even been born. On September 11, 2001, sadly, America experienced a premeditated, vicious, deadly attack. The bright, sunny September morning was suddenly transformed to darkness, destruction, and death. Children who had waved goodbye to their parents that morning, for many, it was their last goodbye. Mother or father would never come home. 
evil men whose hearts were filled with hatred toward America hijacked airplanes filled with innocent men, women, children. They turned the innovation and instruments of air travel into weapons of destruction. Their physical targets were the Twin Towers in New York, the Pentagon, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. But their real target was Western culture, our legacy, our heritage, our liberty, and America's greatness. Thousands of lives were lost that day. Thousands more would have died had it not been for the heroism of ordinary Americans, first responders, and everyday Americans who saw the need and responded and acted. During that period of darkness and despair, something significant happened. In October, workers at Ground Zero in New York City were digging through the ruin and the rubble. Rescue operations had already turned to recovery and removal. One of the workers spotted something amazing, different, out of place. A single calorie pear tree miraculously sprouted a few tiny green leaves. The calorie pear does not normally sprout leaves in October unless it's striving to live. The tree was literally decapitated and buried under a mountain of concrete, steel, and ash. But that calorie pear tree refused to die. Workers from the New York Parks Department took that tree to their nursery. With each passing day, they rehabilitated and the tree grew stronger. They named it the Survivor Tree. Out of the torn, damaged, beaten, and burned trunk, new life grew. In 2010, the Survivor Tree was returned and replanted at the 911 Memorial Plaza. It's now stronger and more resilient than ever before. The Survivor Tree is an inspiration to all who learns about it, it's a symbol of determination, optimism, resiliency. It's a symbol of persistence, refusing to give up, even in the face of death and destruction. So why do I tell you about that? Let me tell you the rest of the story. The legacy of the survivor tree is not limited to a park in New York City at 911. The FFA is growing the legacy of the survivor tree around the world. Students at John Bone Agricultural High School in Flushing, Queens, New York, care for and distribute about 400 seedlings from the survivor tree. The trees are donated and planted in communities hit by the tragedies of hurricane, flood, tornado, fire, and terror attacks. From Boston to San Bernardino, from Haiti to Paris, from Orlando to Fort Hood, from London to Spain, and many other places, they proudly grow as a symbol of determination. Seedlings of the 911 survivor tree stand as a witness to faith, hope, resiliency, and the support of America, and that chapter FFA is growing a legacy. So I'm glad to have here at the convention with us Stephen Perry, the Assistant Principal of Agriculture and Business at John Bone Agricultural High School. He has several of his faculty and students with him. I was blown away by their operation. Let's take a moment and give them a round of applause to recognize for their work. Thank you guys at John Bone. There you are. Let me see you back there. There you go. There it goes, guys. Great example of FFA leadership and determination and a wonderful story. So the question is, the answer is, you are growing a legacy that inspires in more ways than one. At USDA, you may have heard of our new motto, it's do right and feed everyone. We work to ensure everyone who interacts with us has a positive experience, and we want to make sure that we put our service to others first. I'm so encouraged when I hear of those in the next generation who are learning the skills required to feed everyone and the leadership qualities to do it right. I've done a lot of jobs in my life. Nothing has shaped my own work ethic and my appreciation for the work ethics of others like growing up on a farm. This is not a job to me. It's a mission. I look out across this crowd and I see leaders, now and future leaders. 
I've got grandchildren who are your age. This role is a high calling to which I am passionately committed. My mission is to serve you and to help you in growing a legacy that learns, to help you grow a legacy that leads, to help you grow a legacy that feeds, to grow a legacy that believes, and yes, to help you grow a legacy that inspires your colleagues, your peers, and those around you. Because, as I've told you before, you inspire me, and I want to thank you for that. May God bless you, may God bless the FFA, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Secretary Purdue, thank you so much for being with us and for demonstrating your support of agriculture, FFA, and agricultural education through the many roles you've fulfilled throughout the years. It's incredible to see the amount of work you've been able to accomplish since your short time since being elected. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me once again in thanking our United States Secretary of Agriculture, Sonia Purdue. National Convention reminds me of a great big family reunion. And some of my favorite people to spend time with at family reunions are those family friends that really seem more like family. That is an exact description for this next group of individuals. Today, we have the honor of hosting young farmers from our neighboring countries of both Canada and Mexico here with us during the first general session, truly demonstrating the importance of international agriculture, as well as the importance of both formal and informal agricultural education. Please help me in welcoming these young farmers to our first session. Thank you so much for joining us here at the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. There's an episode of season four where Michelle wins a goldfish at a local carnival, but then quickly realizes how difficult a task it's going to be to care for and raise it at home. In Full House Townsend edition, this looks like the time where we incubated and then hatched and raised baby chicks back home in our downstairs bathroom. Each time a new chick hatched, we were so excited that we didn't realize how much hard work and effort it was going to take to keep those birds healthy and alive. Without knowing it, we're acting on the second line of our FFA motto, doing to learn. Instead of simply learning concepts from a textbook, agricultural education enables students to apply those concepts learned in other, in other classes in a real world way that helps those topics make sense through an applied learning strategy just like what we're experiencing with those chicks back home. This applied learning has been made possible for 100 years because of a piece of legislation that was enacted by two Georgia congressmen, Senator Hoke Smith and Representative Dudley Hughes. We have each been positively impacted by the Smith-Hughes Act of 1917 in some way, regardless of if we realize it or not. Back home with those chicks, each time a new egg hatched, it was cause for celebration. And this, the 100th anniversary of the Smith-Hughes Act, is an even greater cause for us to celebrate. And FFA members have been doing so across the country for this entire year. It's incredible to see the impact that one piece of legislation can make on an entire organization. Because of the Smith-Hughes Act, we are able to continue our long-standing tradition of learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve. In the past, the Smith-Hughes Act has been recognized at the National FFA Convention by having a delegate from the state of Georgia present a gavel. The gavel being presented today was carved from a maple tree that originated off of Dudley Hughes' farm. We are grateful for the work of Dr. Moore from North Carolina State University for helping making this presentation possible. Today, I am proud to welcome to the stage Laura Beth Bland from the state of Georgia to present this gavel. 
Mr. President, on behalf of the Georgia FFA Association, this gavel is presented to the National FFA Organization in honor and remembrance of the Smith Hughes Act and its vital role in the history of agricultural education. Thank you, Laura Beth, and thank you to the Georgia FFA Association for helping make this commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Smith Hughes Act possible. Let's give them a huge round of applause. I am honored to accept this gavel on behalf of the National FFA Organization. Thanks, Laura Beth. Season 5, Episode 11. After the twins have been introduced to the show, Jesse accidentally mixes up their socks, which coincidentally is the only differentiating factor between his two identical children. I think regardless if we are twins or not, we can all relate to being mistaken for one of our siblings or friends. This happens all the time in the Townsend household, except it usually takes my mom and dad a couple of minutes to go down the list of 11 kids to get to the right name. The struggles that Jesse and Rebecca experience as new parents on Full House remind me of just how much our FFA advisors care for us as their kids. They mentor and guide us through high school and beyond, and yet are somehow able to bring together different individuals and groups for the benefit of all. The same is true of our next speaker. His work helps guide and direct our national organization while bringing together different individuals, groups, and organizations for the benefit of agricultural education. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming our, the owl himself, our national FFA advisor, Dr. Steve Brown. Roots, FFA's roots run deep, much like a giant oak tree. For 90 years, this organization has met and celebrated the accomplishment of FFA members. Celebrating, it's hard to believe that we're celebrating our 90th National FFA Convention here in Indianapolis. As the song says, it's our roots that keep us grounded, our roots remind us of where we're from. If you think about that FFA jacket you wear, that jacket tells others who you are, where you're from, and yes, our roots. What does this mean for FFA in the next 10 years when we begin to celebrate or, or have the excitement of celebrating our 100th anniversary? What it means is FFA is going to have to change very dramatically in the next 10 years to keep up with agriculture. We must modernize our FFA CDEs, modernize our proficiency awards, modernize our leadership development programs, modernize our awards program, modernize our degree requirements, and become more diverse and more inclusive to meet the needs of 21st century agriculture. It's no longer cows, plows, and sows. FFA must become drones, clones, and technology. We must reflect a modern 21st century agriculture. If you think about our opening ceremonies, the Vice President states, the rising sun is a token of a new era in agriculture. I'm here this evening to share with you the sun has risen and it's a new era in agriculture. Right here, right now, this moment, at the 90th National FFA Convention, we must begin a new era in FFA. A new era in agriculture, a new era in FFA. I need your help. They're going to bring the house lights up. I've heard you a little bit this evening, but you've been a little weak. I'm just telling you, you've been a little weak. So we're going to divide the auditorium up. There's 14 chairs in a row, so seven of you on this side, you're this direction to the rafters. The, the seven from this side, you're this direction from the rafters. You know the words, but we're going to see if you can do it, and I want to see if you, you can overcome that weakness you've had. So your words are... I can. 
Your words are, we will. I want to see who can do it the best. So are you ready on cue? Let's try it. We'll practice once. Okay, you ready? You're doing great, but I want you to hear this and think about this. I can become a change agent for agriculture. We will become a new era in FFA. Change is hard, very hard, sometimes painful. It's easy to depend upon and rely upon our roots, but just like that oak tree, that oak tree loses its leaves, loses some acorns, and sometimes loses some branches. But it always rejuvenates, grows some new branches, new leaves. And we, as FFA, must harness the sunlight of a new day in agriculture. We can no longer rest on our laurels. We're not growing laurels. We're growing leaders building communities and strengthening agriculture to lead it into the future. Let's face it, some FFA programs are very near and dear to us, near to our heart. We like them and we enjoy them, but we also must ask the question, do they reflect a 21st century modern day agriculture? Are there barriers that keep us from being more diverse, and more inclusive of our students or students and FFA members. Some will need to change. Some of our programs, some of our awards areas, some things we're going to need to change. Some will need to be modified. Some will need to be added. And yes, some will no longer exist. They will be deleted. But remember this. Programs do not make an organization. People do. You do. We cannot fail agriculture. We must prevail to change FFA so that we continue to be a primary provider of agricultural talent. A primary provider of growing leaders, building communities, and strengthening a changing agriculture. FFA is an amazing organization. It has strong roots and served the agriculture industry well. However, we must examine that it's time to change. FFA in the future will look different, will offer broader opportunities for members, and will be different. In FFA, we must eradicate mediocrity. We must initiate thoughtful, sustaining 21st century change to meet the employee needs of 21st century agriculture. Faith in the future is not faith if you're not willing to take the risk. Belief in the future is not belief if you're not willing to take the risk. The FFA creed begins with, I believe in the future of agriculture. Do you truly believe? Again, they're going to bring the house lights up. I want to hear you one more time. I need your help. Do you believe in the future of agriculture? Can you say, We must have that I can, we will attitude. We must believe in the future of agriculture and we must become a new FFA. Fear can paralyze. Fear can make us ineffective. Fear can make us not want to do things. However, faith can lead us into the future. A faith to make positive change. In basketball, I guarantee you, you'll miss 100% of the shots that you're not willing to take. Even in difficult times, FFA is agriculture's best hope for the future. 
We must make change, dramatic change. We must dream big. There's not a challenge that we can't face. And together, FFA must reach high. We must spread our wings and change to meet the future needs of agriculture. I want us to dream big, to have the I can, we will attitude, and have a great 90th National FFA Convention. Thank you. With a heart full of faith, a whole lot of luck, and some love to see you through. Dream big, and it's just my cup. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for your support of agricultural education students from across the country. Your work enables more than 653,000 students to get the opportunity to experience premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through their agricultural education programs. Thank you so much for kicking off this, off this convention with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our National FFA advisor, Dr. Steve Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Towards the end of season eight, Stephanie, Kimmy, and some of their friends decide to start a band in an attempt to make it big. Now, <clears throat> I don't think any of us Townsends were ever that bold, but I will admit that one of our guilty pleasures was spending hours jamming out on rock band. Whether I was playing drums, the guitar, or singing, I think we should all be thankful that there are, is not any video footage of that hot mess. Thankfully, we don't need Stephanie, Kimmy, or my siblings and I to help entertain us. For that, we have this next group of talented individuals. Under the direction of Mr. Joe LaJoy and sponsored by Dat Auger Sciences, please welcome back our national FFA band. Hello, FFA. My name is Samantha Ngati from the Freedom FFA chapter in the Cheesehead State of Wisconsin. Rock with us now as your 2017 National FFA Band presents a piece honoring the late and beloved Dick Clark, the legendary host of American Bandstand and New Year's Rock and Eve. Please enjoy Rock, Roll, and Remember. <laughs>
That was great. <laughs> there is an episode of Full House where Stephanie realizes that she's pretty talented at Little League Baseball. Weekends at the ballpark were a signature of Full House Townsend edition. Most of us played baseball at some point. In fact, here is a real gem of my younger brother Jared from back in the day. As we got older, some of us stuck with it, but most of us moved on to other sports. Regardless, sports were and are a daily conversation in the Townsend household. Sports were an opportunity for us to learn and grow. Sports was what our schedule revolved around in the Townsend household. From games to matches to competitions, tournaments, and so many other sporting events, that was where we learned what dedication and grit looked like. The same is true of our next speaker. Her dedication and grit have led to her fighting for what she believes in both in and out of the boxing ring. She is the most successful female in the history of women's boxing as a four-time undefeated world champion with a 24-0 record with 21 of those wins coming by knockout. At the same time, she's a health and wellness expert, an actress and TV host, a entrepreneur and a mother. All successes because of her dedication and grit. Here to share her story with us, please welcome our keynote speaker, Layla Ali. That's great. I mean, you guys are packed in here, all up there, all around. Wow. Hey, I see you guys. I see you. I have to tell you, I'm amazed at your presence here. I mean, you guys are in all the hotels, everywhere I look, in all the restaurants. I see the blue coats, and I'm like, yes, I love it. I mean, that would have been so fun for me to be in high school and to make a trip like this, especially. I see all the pretty girls out there. You guys have nice hair. I've noticed that. <laughs> You do, I mean, you guys have some beautiful hair and the handsome guys, so have fun, but be good, okay? <laughs> be good now, don't be hooking up. I know the parents, I know the parents are here. The parents are here and the adults are here as well. That's the mother inside of me. Speaking about being a mother, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I have to be honest with you, sometimes I get anxiety when I think about the future of our world. You know, with all the things that are going on in the world, I don't have to get into that. You guys know, and I'm like, wow, what's the world going to be like when my kids get older? It's kind of scary. But the more I read about the FFA and the wonderful work that you guys are doing and that they're cultivating leaders for the future, and you guys know and I, that you can make a difference, that makes me feel good. So thank you so much. I just want to say from me to you, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, because as you know, we need leaders more now than ever. So thank you. So do you guys know who Muhammad Ali is? Yeah. I kind of figured you did, but you know, I don't like to assume. So, you know, anyone who might not know who he is, he is the GOAT, the greatest of all times. That's where that term came from, by the way, from my dad. He's known to be one of the greatest boxers of all times, and he's a global humanitarian um, around the world for all the great things that he's done. So, do you guys believe in destiny? I do. I do now, especially, um, you know, ever since I saw this news clipping of me when I was a child with my father holding me. I'm trying to change. There it is. That's me as a baby. My father was holding me. And as you can see, it says the next champ with a question mark. Of course, I had to put the exclamation on that question. But I'm the youngest of nine kids. My dad has nine children. I'm his youngest girl. And I'm the only one to become a professional boxer. So, growing up, yes, nobody knew. Thank you, thank you. Some, that's another photo of me and my dad. That's a more up close photo I wanted to see. I was kind of cute, right? He had no idea that I was gonna grow up and start knocking people out, you know, as I got older. And then that's a photo of me, I'm the smaller one in the blue with my sister Hannah. Now, that's my only full sister from the same, we are both the same parents. Now, she's dad's favorite. A lot of people think that it would be me, that I was daddy's girl. 
because I'm the boxer, but actually that's not the case at all. So like I said, we have, um, you know, oh, oh, I forgot about it. Now you gotta, you gotta love that Afro picture. I mean, I just threw that in there because I just love that picture. My mom put that bow in my hair and it just looks like a piece of lint, right? But it's actually a bow. I don't know, it did something though. I think it's kind of cute. But uh, I, I always have to include that. So that's a photo, that's me in the front in the black with the rest of my brothers and sisters. The only one that's missing is my brother Assad, who my father later adopted. So I'm the youngest of my father's natural children, only one to become a fighter. And people assume that I started boxing because I simply wanted to be like my dad. You know, maybe I was in the gym with him when he was training and I said, I want to be like dad. But actually that's not the case at all. So as I grew up, my parents divorced and I lived with my mother and I said, you know what, mom, I want to be independent. I want to, you know, move out the house when I'm 18. And she used to be like, yeah, yeah, Layla, whatever. You know, and then I said, okay, I'm going to do some research because I need to pay my own bills. I need to go to school full time and make money, right? So I started going to school for manicuring because I saw that I could get a manicuring license. And I was always very ambitious. So after high school, I took it upon myself to take the city bus, public transportation, across town to cosmetology school, eventually got my license to become a manicurist. And by the time I was 18, I moved out of the house, had my own clientele, eventually started my own business called Layla's Nail Studio. And I actually have a photo of me at the nail salon like, yep, did it, made it. So I had a successful business, living on my own, paying my own rent, because I was always the one that was like, I don't want daddy to take care of me, I'm gonna do my own thing. So I was very strong-minded. So that's at the time, when I was about 18, and I saw, I went to a friend's house to watch a fight, and I was watching Mike Tyson. You guys know who Mike Tyson is? Okay, you guys know. So, you know, you guys are young, so sometimes I'm not sure, but Mike Tyson was like in his prime at the time. So I went to go watch a Mike Tyson fight. Now, I wasn't a big boxing fan, even though my father was Muhammad Ali. So I'm watching this big fight like everybody else. We got our popcorn, our soda, we're ready to watch the fight. Next thing I know, these women come into the ring. And I was like, what, what is this? What's going on? Like, what is, what's happening? I didn't know women's boxing even existed. So I was totally keyed in to the TV, amazed. And these women get in the ring, they start slugging it out, slugging it out, and they got like bloody noses. I actually have a photo of the first fight. That's what I saw. Blood all over the place. This is uh, the girl in the pink was winning the fight. And I was like, I want to do that. That just looks like it's right up my alley. And my best friend was there and she said, yeah, you could do it. And her dad was like, Layla, you're crazy. Those, those girls will take your head off. What are you talking about? I totally zoned him out and just couldn't believe that I didn't know that women boxed. Now, I was a little bit of a fighter before I became a professional fighter, got in a little trouble. That's why I'm so impressed with you guys, because I was like, totally wouldn't have been in the FFA, like if I was like in high school, because I was just kind of going down the wrong path. Um, so when I saw women's boxing, something in me connected. Obviously, it's in my DNA, too. So when I saw it, I said, I want to do that. But by the time I went home, that's when the fear set in. I heard this gentleman before me, talking about fear and talking about doubt, right? So I had that doubt, like, I have this plan to go to school full time, I'm going to City College, I'm planning to transfer to the University of Southern California, get my, you know, business degree, open nail salons all over the country, that was my plan. And I was a planner. So for me, I was like, well, what's everyone, everyone gonna say? You know, I've never ever had an interest in boxing before, how can I do it? You know, my father being, famous growing up, I never wanted to be famous, so that was an inner conflict that I had to deal with. Um, <clears throat> so it took me about a year of contemplation of just thinking about this seed that had been planted. And then I decided one day that I wanted to go for it. Now at the time, like I said, Christy Martin was the most famous woman in boxing. Now the time that I saw boxing was the first time that a lot of people saw boxing. So the world just really didn't know about women's boxing. This was the first female televised fight on a major undercard for people to see her. So I told one of my clients that I wanted to box. And she said, oh, I have a boxing trainer. And I said, you do? You know, I didn't ask my dad because, remember me, I'm that independent one that doesn't want to ask dad for help. So I said, let me go to the gym. Let me figure out if this is something I actually want to do. Because I already knew there would be a lot of pressure on me. My father had a legacy. I didn't want to embarrass him. So I said, let me just see if this is what I want to do. So I went to the gym. I started training and instantly fell in love with it. So after school and after work, six days a week, I started going to the boxing gym. 
working out. And even though it was hard, I didn't care. I loved it. I couldn't wait to get there and work on my jab, work on my right hand, work on my uppercut, and then finally get into the ring and actually spar. That's what you call when you get into the ring and actually fight and train. And trust me, I've seen a lot of people come through the gym saying they want to fight. And the first thing they'll do is put you in the ring and see what happens when you actually get hit. And you're either going to get mad and want to hit somebody back, or you're going to want to turn your back and get out of the ring. Well, I got mad, you know, and I was like, you know, it got around quick that I was kind of doing really well. And then all of a sudden, you know, it got around that I was training. So one thing that you have to do as a fighter is you have to make weight. You have to be in a certain weight class. So for me, I had to figure out what weight class was I going to be in. And as you can see on the left, that's the only photo I can find. Sorry, why do I have kitten ears on? Because that was a Halloween photo. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> at the time, I was about 30 pounds heavier than I needed to be to be in the weight class that I, that I ended up being in, to be at my strongest and to be fit. And as you can see, that was a weigh-in. You always have to weigh in before a fight. And that was another photo just to show you the difference of maybe six to eight months of just training and eating right and doing all that. And as I mentioned, training was hard, but I loved it. So I absolutely knew this is what I wanted to do. So the news got around that Muhammad Ali's daughter is in the boxing gym. News travels quick. Got back to my dad. So my dad comes in town because he lived in a different state. And he says, you know, Layla, I hear you're boxing. And I was like, yeah, dad, it's true. So he sat me down to have a conversation. And he knew that he couldn't talk me out of it. So he tried to talk me out of it indirectly and use reverse psychology on me. So he says, you know, well, you know the whole world's going to be watching you. You know, what are you going to do, you know, if, if they're, they're judging you? And I said, Dad, I'm ready for that. I can handle it. And he said, okay, well, you know, what if you, what if you get knocked down, you know, in the ring? I said, well, you got knocked down before. I'm going to get back up just like you did. And then he says, well, what if you get knocked out? And I was like, now that's not going to happen. But <laughs> if it does, then I'm going to ask for a rematch. So then he thought about it for a while. So his, his line of questioning just wasn't working. And then finally, he started to say, well, you know, women have breasts. You know, you're not supposed to be fighting. And I said, Dad, we wear chest protection just like men wear cup protection. So we were tit for tat. You know, everything he said, I had something for him. I was like, what? What, what you got? So finally, he said what was really on his mind. He said, you know, it's not a woman's sport. It's a man's sport. It's not for you to do. It's too hard. So me being me, I stayed cool and just said, Dad, I understand you know how you feel about it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I want to pause right there because as I've gotten older and now my dad has passed and obviously I've reflected on a lot of the conversations that we've had and I think about just how he started boxing and what his story was and how he must have felt in that moment. And a lot of you won't even probably be able to connect with this because you don't have children yet and you're not, you know, at that stage. But my father started boxing Similar, I mean, he wasn't an athlete, just like I'm not an athlete, but what happened when he was 12 years old in his neighborhood, in Louisville, Kentucky, anyone here from Louisville? Nobody? Come on, nobody? Okay, somebody in the back. Anyone here from California? You know, I'm from California. All right. <laughs> All right, Cali, represent. So my dad was 12 years old. Someone in his neighborhood stole his bike. He got really mad, and he went to the, one of the policemen. He said, somebody stole my bike, and I'm going to beat them up. I'm going to get them. And the policeman said, well, do you know how to fight? And he said, no, I don't. Well, that policeman happened to be an amateur trainer for a local boxing gym. And he said, well, you need to come in the gym and learn how to fight. And that's how my dad ended up going to the boxing gym to train, because his intention was to go get these guys that stole his bike. But then he fell in love with boxing, and he found his talent. So that was his destiny, and he was, he was fast. You know, he had the speed, he had agility, he had charisma. So then he went on to have an amateur career, and eventually went to the Olympics and won gold for the United States. At 18, he came back with his gold medal around his neck. And at the time, we still had racism and segregation, where you still, it would say, you know, for whites only, he couldn't go eat in certain restaurants. So he thought, because he fought for his country, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna change everything for all the black people. You know, I'm the champ now, so I can go eat in these restaurants and everyone else can come with me. But then when he came back, he saw nothing had changed. So he actually took his medal and said, this means nothing, and threw it into the, the river. And that's a documented story that you guys can, can read up on, or some of you may already know it. But at that moment, that's when my dad pretty much decided that he was going to fight for something deeper than just being able to say he's a champion, being able to say you know, he was a winner and making a lot of money. He wanted to change the world. And he understood that when you're a winner 
when you're the champ, when you have a lot of money, when you have the Rolls Royce, when you have the Rolex, that's when people want to listen to you. People naturally want to listen to you when you're successful, and they, they measure success on the things that you have sometimes. So that's the things I, I grew up listening to when I was a kid, the importance of why he did certain things. So my father now goes, goes and becomes a world champion, okay? And he's like the man. I mean, anywhere you go in the world, they know and love Muhammad Ali. Then they tried to enlist him in the Vietnam War, and he refused due to his religious beliefs. And then he got stripped of his titles. He got stripped of everything, couldn't make money, um, you know, got sentenced to five years in jail, which later got overturned by Supreme Court. But he also ended up fighting battles, which a lot of people conclude that might have caused his Parkinson's, which ultimately killed him. So, I say that to say that here's your daughter sitting in front of you with all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into his career and all the, that was connected to, and here I am, your baby girl, who you know doesn't know anything about what she's about to get into, uh, is telling you she wants to box. Of course you're gonna say don't do it. It was fear, you know? And of course he had never seen women box before, so he really believed that I couldn't do it. So I have a different way of looking at it now, but at that time I had to do what was in my heart even if I would have thought of that back then, I would have been like, well, that's great, but I'm still going to do my thing because we all have to live our lives. So I said, I'm going to do it, Dad. So I went and made my public announcement and uh, went on Good Morning America. Sorry, that's, the, that's the, the day I had that conversation with my dad. And you can see we were looking really serious. <laughs> Look at his face. He was, he was really trying to talk me out of it. So next thing I did was I went on Good Morning America and told the world that I was going to box, and that's when the floodgates opened, everything that I had already mentally prepared myself for, all of the, you're too pretty to box. I mean, I'll tell you how many times I've heard that. Um, you know, women don't box. Women can't fight. Then, of course, the one that really annoyed me the most was, is this a publicity stunt? You know, you must want to be an actress or a model, and maybe you're using boxing as a platform, and that wasn't the case at all. So I was like, a very young girl, and all I wanted to do was box. So then I kind of had this really tough exterior, and I felt like I always had to prove myself, right? And I remember writing my first book, Reach, Finding Strength, Spirit, and Personal Power, which I'm trying to show you. And that's a memoir that I wrote back then when I was about 23 years old, actually, um, that just talks about a lot of the adversity that I faced, which I don't have time to get into here with you. Um, you know, when my parents divorced, I had a really dysfunctional childhood with my mom and her ex-husband and a lot of anger inside of me that made me want to be a fighter in the first place. I encourage you guys to read that book. Um, it's available on Amazon. You can check it out. But so I went ahead and, and told the world that I was going to fight and everybody was just like, what's, what's going to happen? You know, what's, what's she going to do? You know, women, you know, they, they had never seen women fighting really before. So I remember my pro debut, I had 80 different news media um, people there. Now, even though I wasn't fighting on television, uh, because I didn't have an amateur career, so this was going to be my first fight ever. There was no women's boxing in the Olympics back then. There is now. But when I started fighting, women's boxing was not in the Olympics. So I went on and went pro. So I had 80 different news media there. They were ready to report what happened. So it might as well have been on TV. My dad was in the front row, and they were like, what's she going to do? Well, I knocked the girl out in 54 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's right! <laughs> so that was the beginning of my, my boxing career, and um, I was a little irritated, as you can see on my face. I'm not smiling. Um, that was the look of, oh, that training for 54 seconds? Are you kidding me? Like, your, your adrenaline's going when you're in the ring. Everyone always asks you, what does it feel like to fight? And it's like, the training is grueling, but when you get in there, you love it. You love every moment of it. And as soon as it's over, you can't wait to do it again. And then you get in training, you're like, oh, God, why do I put my body through this? But it's like a, it's a crazy cycle. But when you're in the ring, like, you want it to last a little bit longer. So I was a little upset by that. Um, some of my most memorable fights I want to share with you, one of them was with Jackie Frazier. And some of you are probably too young to know the history, but I know some of the adults do. Frazier, Joe Frazier and my father fought three times. This is his daughter. Now, Joe Frazier was the person who became the champ. When my dad got stripped of his titles, <clears throat> when he wouldn't go to the war, they, Joe Frazier fought for the, title, the vacant title and won it. So my dad used to taunt him, call him all, all kind of names, say some pretty mean things, actually. And like, you're not the real champ. I'm the real champ. And then you, you have to fight me to be the real champ. So he got in the ring, and then Joe Frazier beat him. 
which was big because my father had been undefeated. And, you know, he had many years off. He was kind of rusty. So he beat him, and then they came back. They fought two more times, and my dad won. So they had a trilogy. So when I started boxing, I inspired Jackie Frazier to start boxing. So she had some fights under her belt, but I didn't really take her seriously. I was like, oh, you know, this is, she doesn't have a title. She's not a serious boxer. But it made sense for me to fight her business-wise, so I fought her. And Jackie ended up being tough. You know, there I am, gloving it up before the fight. And then we had a tough battle. She was strong and tough, much tougher than I thought she was going to be. Went the distance, and as you can see, I ended up victorious. So the next um, very memorable fight would be against this young, this, well, she wasn't young at the time, but Susie Taylor, who was a champion. So I said I wanted some titles, so she was the first person whose title I went over. And it was funny because she was someone who, before I started boxing, they would say, that girl's tough. You know, when I was training in the gym, they're like, you don't want to fight her till you're ready, and here I am facing her. Um, and then, of course, I beat her and, and took her title. So that was a second round stoppage, I think. So, and then, <laughs> thank you. That's fun. Sounds crazy, I mean, to be talking about knocking people out, but you know, it is boxing, so it's just like kind of what we do. But then look, I fought Christy Martin. Christy Martin is the woman who I showed you that I saw fighting for the first time, so that was surreal to be facing her. And to her credit, Christy was a little smaller than me. We made the weight classes work. I came down a weight, she came up, and then we fought. And you know, she was tough though. She actually went like four rounds and before I stopped her. So as you can see, my dad was in the ring with me. And a lot of people throughout my life, they knew that my dad didn't really want me to, to box, but he always supported me, you know, and came to my fights when he could because he did have a disease. So sometimes he wasn't able to make it to all of the fights. But, you know, that, that meant a lot to me, to have him in the arena. It meant a lot to him to hear the crowd chanting, Ali, Ali, every time he came out to sit down, um, you know, with me. and then. Every time after a fight, I'd always have cake waiting for me in my dressing room, as you can see. Every time. Look, I love to eat, first of all, and I love sweets. So one thing that I would refrain from is having sweets. So that was the last thing I would look at. Now, it's funny because these dressing rooms back here remind me of the type of rooms that I used to come out of to fight, because I used to fight in arenas like this. And I would look at that cake, and I'd be like, I'm coming back in like two or three rounds. I'm going to knock this girl out so I could have my cake. <laughs> that was my motivation. So one day. My father came to my dressing room after like a, a title fight. I had won some titles, I was a world champion, and he said, you know, I want to talk to you. And he had a very serious look on his face. And he said, you know what, Layla, I was wrong. You know, women can fight, and you can fight, and I'm proud of you. And of course, that made me cry, and it made me have a moment, because I didn't realize how much that would mean to me, for him to say that to me. And then we shared a piece of cake, and we kept it moving. But the funny thing is, is that next thing I know, he's trying to teach me how to box. Show you, throw your jab like I'm like, you're late, Dad. Like, are you really trying to teach me how to box now? So I thought that was, I thought that was really cute that my dad was doing that. So anyway, that's me and Nelson Mandela. So my last fight was in 2007 in South Africa. And I had the opportunity to have Nelson Mandela there, who also was a boxer. My, many of you may not know that. He has, was an amateur boxer, and he was really good. So he came to the fight, and they put, brought this elaborate chair. He had this special chair. I don't know. It was hand-carved wood. It was beautiful. It was like a king's throne. And they went through all this work to put it in the audience. He was sitting there, and the fight starts. And then I end up winning in a one-round knockout. And I was like, I'm sorry. I remember saying to him after the fight, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry you know, that I didn't give you a better show. But he was just proud that I won. So that was my last fight. And after I decided to leave boxing, I said, you know what, I really want to do something different, explore my other talents, my passions. I knew that boxing wasn't something that I was going to want to do forever. Um, I reached all of my goals, and I said, you know, I want to start a family. You know, of course I had to find a husband, but um, I, had, I had these goals, right? So Dancing with the Stars called. You guys familiar with Dancing with the Stars? I like that section. You guys are hype over there. <laughs> they always, come on now, you guys, get in there. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just joking. I heard you guys were a little rowdy, but I like that because I'm a little rowdy too. So Dancing with the Stars called, and I ended up going on the show and dancing with Max. And he, um, he was tough. He was a tough partner. But we went to the finals. We went to the last. At that time, you, you get to the finals, and that was the last show. So I came in third. But I felt like I won because I had all this airtime. I had a whole new audience. I was able to show a different side of myself. Because as you all know, people sometimes put you in a box. 
and they label you. So now I'm the boxer, you know, because I was always serious and talking about, it's a little intimidating, you know, hair braided back, you know, grease on your face, ready to fight, talking about knocking people out, you know, that's not very commercial, you know. So um, I had to show a different side of myself, which I already knew was there. So I went to the finals and Dancing with the Stars, then went ahead and got married. It didn't happen that fast, but you know, I'm just giving you the, that's Curtis, he's my husband, he's, he's a, uh, he used to play in the NFL, he retired. That was another photo, um, which I'm so happy my dad got to see that day. Um, and then we had our, our children. I had my first son, well, my only son, Curtis. That's Curtis Jr., a little cutie pie. And then that's Sydney, my daughter. And then there's a picture of us currently, as you can see. So after I did that, I had to really start thinking about what can I do that I love like I love boxing? Because boxing is hands down my first love, even to this day. Um, so I had to figure out what would sustain me, what would make me happy, what, what is going to be something that I can be passionate about where it won't feel like work, the same way boxing didn't feel like work. So I started doing some television hosting um, I did American Gladiators with Hope Colgan, but still wasn't really fulfilled. I had all these opportunities coming to me, but I had to say, what am I going to do? So then I figured it out. It's health, fitness, and wellness. Um, that's just a, uh, I did that ad for milk, and I also did one with my father that I couldn't find, but we both, it was cute, we both had our milk mustaches on. Um, and I ended up doing sh shows like, I'm just showing you some of the hosting that I've done, Late Night Chef Fight, which was a, was a cooking competition. Are you guys familiar with Chopped on the Food Network? <clears throat> you guys like, yeah, I like CHOP too. So I went on there and won a couple times, and that was important to me because I really wanted to show the world that I was passionate about cooking. You really have to put that image out there. And that really started me in that space to cultivate, you know, my health and wellness and, and cooking. Because anytime I had the opportunity to talk about food, I talk about healthy food, I talk about whole food. That's me on the Steve Harvey show, as you can see. And then I started the Layla Ali lifestyle brand. And my brand is all about health, fitness, and wellness. So I have a podcast, Podcast One. I'm currently working on my second cookbook, which is coming out in January. I'm super excited about this, my baby. Um, and it's all about whole, fresh food. That's something you guys can um, appreciate because I talk about in the book. I don't only give recipes, but I talk about the importance of you know, starting your own garden, you know, sustain sustainability, you know, eating quality food, because I'm trying to get people to get off all of this processed junk food that's causing a lot of the heart disease and diabetes and health problems that we have, and encouraging people to take control of their health. One of the shows that I'm currently hosting is Homemade Simple, which again is just to drive home my brand where I'm not only going into people's homes, deserving families that have really great human interest stories, but we're remaking their rooms, but then I actually get in the kitchen with them and cook a healthy meal, all using whole foods, and I also educate them on quality ingredients and things like that. So when I think about my evolution, um, because it definitely has been an evolution, you know, to go from boxing to hosting. You know, I used to be on TV talking about, oh yeah, I'm gonna knock her out in the first round, you know, to watch me on Homemade Simple. I'm Layla Ali. It's like two different things, you know. So it's been, it hasn't, it didn't just happen overnight, you know. And I've learned and I've grown and I've changed. And I think about the topic, right? I mean, I think about your theme, I can and we will. And I think, wow, you know, it does have to start with an I because you first have to find out what your passions are and what you want to do in life and set your goals, right? And you have to fulfill those. And they're going to grow and they're going to change because you're young, just like mine did. But when you learn at a young age about setting goals and reaching them, then that's very, very powerful. And you have to think about what you want your contribution to be. And again, that's gonna grow and that's gonna change. But when you're at least thinking in that mindset, um, you know, at the same time doing what makes you happy, and then you're prepared to do the hard work, I mean, you, you've already, trust me, you've already kind of beat half the battle. And then when I think about we will, I think about my father as he taught me growing up that service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. My father truly believed that being human was all about giving back, helping others. And that's what I love about the FFA, that they're really instilling that in us because the more that we can realize that we're more alike than we are different and how connected we are, the better the world will be. And I commend all of you for learning at such a young age that you individually have the power to make a change. The, I'm talking about small changes in your neighborhood, in your community, in your state, in your country, around the world, whatever it is, 
you have the power to make a change. And a lot of people go through life never knowing that. All they do is think about how to pay their bills, how to put food in their, their kids' mouths, and that's stressful. So it is hard when you, know, you don't have your own situation set up to, to even start thinking about others. So that's why it's important to fulfill your own dreams, your own goals, you know, and I learned that at a young age too. So again, I just want to say that I have been super excited to come here and actually finally have the chance to speak to you guys because you guys put a big smile on my face. You guys have already kind of figured a lot of it out and now all you have to do is just decide what you want to do in life and that has to be a great feeling. So I want to say thank you so much for letting me come here today and share my story. Thank you! Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. I see you. <laughs> Be good. <laughs> thank you, guys. Layla, thank you so much for sharing your message with us this evening. It's incredible through your story that we were able to see that individually we are so capable, but together with those around us, we were able to accomplish so much more. Exactly. Thank you for being with us here this evening. We are proud to present to you a photo from 15 years ago oh, wow. when your father, Muhammad Ali, spoke here at the 75th National FFA Convention and Expo. Thank oh, you so much for being thank here. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Have fun, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. As, as with every show we decide to binge watch, it has been an emotional roller coaster. We have experienced awkward childhood photos and tons of memories. But more importantly, we have gotten to hear from individuals and groups who support us as FFA members and as an organization. We heard from our past national president, Taylor McNeil, our national FFA advisor, Dr. Steve Brown, and just heard the inspiring words from our keynote speaker, Ms. Layla Ali. Throughout every, though every episode, season, and even the session must come to an end, I am stoked by how much of a blast that was. Throughout each episode we saw of both versions of Full House, a common theme was seen. No individual is able to be completely successful without the help of those around them. I can, we will. Be sure to be back in these seats at 2 p.m. tomorrow to experience the second session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. At this session, we will get to highlight those states who have achieved 100% membership, award premier chapters, model of excellence winners at the National Chapter Awards, and also hear the remarkable retiring address of our Central Region Vice President and our friend, Valerie Early. Each of us has something of value to offer this world. We are each capable individuals with incredible talents, gifts, and dreams. While powerful alone, it is when we combine our abilities that we become exponentially influential. With a group of committed individuals, there are no challenges we cannot solve in our industry or in our world. Will you step up to grow yourself a leader and make this world a better place to live? Will you join forces to build communities, strengthen agriculture, and help those around you? Individually, we can. Together, we will.
Madam Secretary, do you have a record of any further business which should now be transacted? I have none, Mr. President. Does any member know of any new or unfinished business which should properly come before this session? We are about to adjourn this first session of the 90th National FFA Convention and Expo. As we mingle with others, let us be diligent in labor, just in our dealings, courteous to everyone, and above all, honest and fair in the game of life. Fellow members and guests, join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I now declare this session adjourned.